there are warnings over medicalising the everyday challenges and worries of life. This is Rishi Sunak, who is giving a major speech on welfare reform later this morning. The Prime Minister will say the focus must shift to what work people might be able to do amid government concerns some are being unnecessarily written off as sick and parked on welfare. Well, James Hansen from Times Radio is still here with us, and we're joined also by another James, former Labour advisor James Schneider. If I can come to you first, James Hansen. Uh, ju just in terms of Rishi Sunak, political capital, the local elections, the general elections mm. that are coming, they obviously think that this is a vote winner, to say we need to get people off benefits, off sick, uh, off the sick culture. And of course, after seven, you can self-certify for seven days, but after that, you have to be signed off. Clearly, this is political expediency. Well, and there's a couple of things going on here. First of all, they have identified the fact that there are a huge number of people and a massive increase since the pandemic, a rise of 700,000 people long-term sick post-COVID, that if they can get some of those back to work, that improves productivity, that may help boost growth and boost the economy generally. So there's that side of things. There's also the fact that the welfare budget has absolutely ballooned over the past 10 years to the extent now that we're spending more on sickness benefits than we are on schools, for example. And so the government are thinking, well, look, if we need to raise money to spend in other areas or potentially to fund future tax cuts in a Tory manifesto, for example, for the election, where are we going to find that money? Mm. And it seems like they have identified the welfare bill as an area they can, they can raid. How might this work, James, in practice? Well, it won't work in practice at all. All it's doing is attacking the sick and vulnerable in society to cover up for 14 years of catastrophic failure. If you want to help people back into work, you help them into work. If you wish to deal with uh, the mental health stresses that people are facing, you provide mental health support. You don't stigmatise them and attack them. And we've been down this road before. We've seen what's happened with... Uh, hundreds, possibly thousands of people who have took their own lives after being passed fit for work by the DWP over the last few years. And if you do want to cut the welfare budget, you should look at the two biggest contributors to the welfare budget, which are subsidising private landlords through housing benefit and topping up low pay. If you really wanted to do something about it, you would boost minimum wage and you would cap rents. And if you wanted to raise money, if you needed to raise money, you would focus on the issue of tax dodging. You are 23 times more likely to be investigated for benefit fraud than for tax dodging, despite the fact that the uh, amount lost to the Treasury in benefit fraud is something in the order of one, one and a half billion a year. And the estimates for the amount lost in tax dodging start at 15 billion and go up as high as 100 billion, depending on who so, you listen So you to. don't think there is a problem then with people sitting at home not actually working when they should be in work? Because James's figures are right. When you look, we've lost 185 million working days lost to sickness or injury. The government, I agree, did lock people up in COVID. There is a culture of actually saying, I don't want to go out and work, equally young people disenfranchised because they can't buy a house. But you, you're saying there isn't a problem. I'm saying if you want to help people, if you want to genuinely help people, as opposed to stigmatise people and put, claim that there is this huge pot of money that people are stealing, then what you would do is provide mental health support and help people genuinely back into work. You would also boost pay and so on and so forth. If you were serious about the things they're claiming they're serious about, you don't go down this route, which we already know leads to vulnerable people taking their own lives when they are told that they are, they, they are fit for work. This is what... The, and the reason why this policy can be put forward by Rishi Sunak and Mel Stride and the clapping seals in much of the media will say, of course, this is very sensible, is because they've never spoken to somebody who has been through this type of uh, physical or mental stress, who is then passed but how fit do you for explain work. The, how do you explain these numbers going from 1.9 million people up to 2.8 mm. uh, million people? Long so, COVID. So, so, pardon? Long COVID. Long COVID, which we believe doesn't really exist. Who's we? The medical profession are very clear about this. No, and all the not. latest studies show no, that not. actually the idea of having a long COVID syndrome mm. doesn't exist. But just, no, just hold, let, on, hold on, hold on. Just... No, no, stop. Please cite one medical source, because that is absolute nonsense. You can't just we sit We spoke here. about it on you, the show you, at the weekend. You can't just sit here and say things that are long COVID, patently it not is a, true. It is a portfolio of other illnesses. But let's just go back to... A portfolio a, of other illnesses which have been brought on by people having COVID. That, you can't, uh, that is a, just a James, pure nonsense. James, it's a pure nonsense. 
just going back to the point, Rishi Sunak, and we were just mm. talking about the political expediency, he will hope this lands uh, and lands well. He will. He will absolutely. I mean, to be honest, you know, it's been another frustrating week for Rishi Sunak politically mm. because the government have had, as they would see it, some good economic news this week. Inflation fell again. Most people, though, aren't feeling the impact of that in their pocket. Prices are still rising, just not rising by as much. And actually, look at most of the stories dominating the headlines this week. We've got allegations over Mark Menzies. The Tory MPs now had the whip suspended. We had Liz Truss's book come out at the start of the week, reminding a lot of people of the chaos of Rishi Sunak's predecessor. So once again, the government tried to move the narrative on, try to talk about what they want to talk about, better economic news, and now this big reform to welfare. And yet, they've got some difficult headlines. To oh, we've got local with. elections coming up. Mm -hmm. It's also an election year. And as you say, what are people thinking about? What are the headlines that stand out? It's not Rishi Sunak's speech later on today no. on sick note culture. It is this sense that they are surrounded by sleaze. It's one allegation yeah, after another. They've almost reached that point now where the public simply aren't listening mm. to what the government has to say. And what they do hear... And what they do pick up on are these increasingly outrageous stories of individual MPs getting into trouble. And obviously Mark Menzies disputes the allegations that have been made against him, but they are very serious allegations. And again, it feeds into this narrative a bit like, you know, in the tail end of John Major's government, when you had all these accusations and stories about sleaze. It fits into a wider narrative about an end of days government. But also, Mark Menzies, it's not just about the individual and the allegations made against him, uh, James, but what the Tories did about it when they were told, because it looks on the surface at this stage that an investigation didn't really start until it was reported in the Times newspaper. Yes, and it, it does seem like either they should, he was in a very difficult situation and he required help and the intervention of the police, or he was doing something that he really shouldn't have done that should also be investigated by the police. And the fact that they, it seems they sat on it, uh, again, shows that, um, you know, they're not good at partying. They're not good at running the country. They're not good at putting money in your pockets. They're not good at running the trains. And they're not good at party but what management. about Angela Rayner? That, that seems to be running still in the press, although today, obviously, it's been, it's been superseded by other things. But, uh, you know, the Labour Party isn't free of sleaze. Uh, I don't think the Angela Rayner... I agree with you, the Labour Party is not free of sleaze, but the Angela Rayner thing has got nothing to do with sleaze whatsoever. The sleaze is... Uh, well, it's a trust issue, though, well, isn't the, the, it? The sleaze is the revolving door between Westminster and corporate lobbying. And Keir Starmer has reopened up the Labour Party to corporate lobbyists and to, uh, to corporate capture. That's what sleaze is. This story about Angela Rayner, which is being given such a huge push by the media and seems like basically pretty much a non-story, and that's why in a poll I saw yesterday, I think it was Savanta poll, a big chunk of the population, something like 40%, think it's a but, smear but, but it is operation. a story if she broke electoral law, isn't it? Uh, so by broke electoral law, you mean was registered at the wrong address? Uh, I mean by also just not declaring the amount of tax she should have paid well, and that's also not registering a... herself by electoral law, exactly right, by registering herself do at the address she was not at. Do you know what the statute of limitations is? I do, do you know what the statute... Year. Right, OK. What, do you know what year that happened in? A long time have ago. You so ever, have, you, have, you, have, you, have you ever... All I'm asking is... Hold on, no, 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 but all I'm asking you is, have you ever been registered at one address because you were living there, then you moved somewhere else and moved back, etc., etc.? Well, it's, no. quite <laughs> an, it's quite an ordinary, quite an ordinary thing. I don't know actually what the well, case is. I don't know that it's ordinary to have a teenage child living I, at an address that you're not. Now that I think, now, at. now that I think is is quite unpleasant um, because who knows, and and frankly, who has the right to know? what uh, the family uh, relations were of people who at the time were not in the public eye, which concerned someone who was a child. I'm sorry, that is not, uh, that's not a public interest. I don't know, but... James, just very... Yeah, 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 like James, well, I, I, I just think, James, you're making the mistake that Labour have made with this story from the start, which is to see it all as a smear. And because it came from, yes, a hostile biography from Lord Ashcroft and is being peddled by a lot of the right-wing press, to somehow dismiss the substance of this story. And that's a mistake. Had Labour... From the start, had Angela Rayner been more transparent, released this, so say, independent tax advice she had had, even had she made an error and had to pay some money back, people would have been understanding. But because they've been very defensive over this, they've made the situation worse. And she's now in a situation in which she's had to say that if she's found to have done anything wrong, she will resign.
She's had to put mm. this as yeah. a really high stakes thing. It didn't need to get to this point. Yeah. Both Jameses, we have to pause it there, I'm afraid. Thank uh, you James Hansen from Times Radio and former Labour advisor, James Schneider.